I know it's tough to be an entrepreneur. Starting off is very difficult. You're, you're desperate. I remember when I was first starting, just being desperate to try to learn everything I could about startups and entrepreneurship. So that's why I was very happy to come here today and share everything I can with you in the time we have together. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, if I'd been better at golf, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's a real honor uh, to be able to speak with you today and to share uh, some thoughts with you and have a conversation with you about entrepreneurship. Um, I want to thank uh, Murray and Lisa and actually the whole Mars community. I think we're very fortunate to have this uh, Mars thing happening here, giving everybody a chance to learn more about entrepreneurship and startups, and um, it's wonderful to be part of it. Um, you know, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship skills, I think, are incredibly important in a lot more than just startups. I think they're great skills to have in lots of different endeavors. You know, yes, maybe you're going to start the next Uber and you'll need lots of entrepreneurship skills, but maybe you're starting up a new venture within an organization, something like the Advanced Energy Center here within Mars. Well, that's an entrepreneurship type activity. Or maybe it's something like organizing your street to um, sponsor a refugee. You need to get a group of people together, you need to raise money, you need to get some leadership, communication. Those are all entrepreneurship skills as well. Which, um, and I know it's tough to be an entrepreneur. Starting off is very difficult, you're, you're desperate. I remember when I was first starting, just being desperate to try to learn everything I could about startups and entrepreneurship and, and finding it hard uh, to get everything I wanted. Um, so that's why I was very happy to come here today and share everything I can with you in the time we have together. But, but bigger than that, I kind of think entrepreneurship is a skill set that just should be more common. It shouldn't be a boutique kind of thing that we come to Mars for. Um, I think somebody should become a social entrepreneur and fight to make entrepreneurship part of the standard high school curriculum. You know, it'd be great if everybody got at least five hours of teaching and entrepreneurship and, and they'd, we'd just be graduating people who are that much more ready to uh, take on the challenges uh, around us. So today, I'm 55, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started three what people call successful startups uh, over the past 26 years. The first was KL Group, which be, was renamed Satraka. It was a software company, a self-financed software company that at its peak had about 250 employees. Uh, about 100 of them were software engineers here in Toronto that were truly world-class uh, software entrepreneurs. Um, about 97% of our revenue was uh, from outside Canada. So we were selling software from, made in Canada outside to the rest of the world. We were profitable every year for 13 years. And in the end, we had a great exit to a NASDAQ uh, traded company in 2002. In many ways, Satraka was my MBA. Um, I knew nothing about business when we started it. You know, I was a software developer. And over those 13 years, I scrambled and learned as fast as I could to stay ahead of it as we grew and then finally exited. Um, but it was also very stressful. It was, it was quite difficult, especially in the last couple of years uh, before we did uh, finish off. After that experience, I took some time off and um, took some courses and had a chance to uh, kind of read some big books <laughs> and something you don't get to do when you're, when you're racing ahead. And um, learned for, at that time about uh, global warming, climate change, and, and uh, you know, research it. I mean, I'm no client climate scientists, but I researched it enough, I learned enough about the science, I trust science and trust reason and kind of came to the conclusion that it is a, a very serious problem, not for us, maybe in our generation, but a really serious problem that we're downloading on future generations. But at the time, I was still very much in, you know, a business person thinking about, you know, for-profit bottom line. So I was searching for some kind of business that could be what was called back then in mid 2000s a double bottom line business something where you know you're 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 trying to be profitable and have a good return for shareholders but also at the same time trying to do something good and bigger than than just uh, looking out for shareholders so um, the idea for bullfrog came along um, mostly because i was personally frustrated that i couldn't get renewable power for my own home and um, so I felt the personal need that I hope our customers feel. Um, and then also learning about how renewable energy is invested in in Canada and realizing that if you're building renewable energy projects in Ontario back in 2005, the only, only um, payer of the 
green premium was the government. The, the, the renewable energy generators didn't think anybody but the government would ever be crazy enough to pay the extra cost of green power uh, in Ontario. So it's kind of that realization, well, hey, maybe there's a lot of other people like me who would be willing to pay a little more for energy um, that, brought, that got the idea for Bullfrog going. Um, that video you saw is a bit old, um, but um, today we are uh, Canada's most trusted green energy um, provider and uh, possibly one of Canada's more successful social ventures. We, we still have that very strong bottom line, double bottom line goal. And, um, and we really stepped up actually in the last few years trying to help new renewable energy projects get funded in Canada. So to this point, we now have about 60 Canadian renewable energy projects that have received funding from Bullfrog as, as they are in early stages of getting developed or being developed. Uh, we have about uh, 50 employees, 10,000 residential customers, and about 2,000 commercial customers. And our mission really is to just make it really easy for Canadians to switch to renewable power, whether it's green electricity or green natural gas, and uh, very shortly making it easy to switch to green uh, liquid fuels for transportation. Um, I'm happy to take questions about Bullfrog, but I will tell you it, is a, it was a weird thing to start. People, mo most of my business peers just thought it was insane. Uh, you're going to go around and charge more for power? Like, you know, do you realize that Canadians are, you know, we're programmed to drive two kilometers to a different gas station because it's a one cent a liter cheaper, right? So you know, they're really going to pay more for renewable energy. But um, I think the magic of Bullfrog was sort of the timing and the brand and the credibility that you know, one of the innovative things we did was uh, introduce uh, an audit. So we had Deloitte and Touche do an audit that actually come and look at our books and make sure we really had bought as much renewable energy as we had sold, and we really had retired it on behalf of our customers. And um, still to this day, uh, you know, renewable energy retailers like Bullfrog in the U.S. and around the world don't do an audit. They don't publish an audit. It's, it's striking to me that... Um, you know, so I think it's, it's little innovative things that we did where we realized what's going to be the skepticism, try to overcome it, and try to do the right thing that's made, been part of what's made Bullfrog successful. Um, now, while I love Bullfrog, and I think that the voluntary renewable energy market is an incredibly important thing and a very powerful thing in our, in our culture and our society, um, I came to realize that it's really not going to... Um, in its, on, on the, at the end of the day, solve the bigger problems. Um, climate change and global warming are really a collective action problem. It's, and, it, and we need a collective action solution. So, um, you know, ultimately we really need the government to play a role in changing how markets work so that uh, renewable energy is, uh, is not more expensive, um, but polluting energy is more expensive. And, and let the market forces then create the change that we need. Um, in effect, we need the rules of the economy tweaked a little bit. Um, pollution, and particularly CO2 pollution, can never be free. CO2 pollution is still free today in Ontario. You, anybody can start a business and pollute as much CO2 as they want at no cost. That is changing, luckily, but it, hasn't, it has been true up until now. And that's, a, that's just never going to be possible in the future. We always have to price these externalities into the future. So a couple of years ago, to try to accelerate that change in the political sphere, I started a, a, a not-for-profit startup with uh, another co-founder. And um, it's really, um, our vision started off really being, well, our vision is a, Canadian, a Canada where free market principles, like the polluter pay principle, are applied to our environmental challenges. So without that, without this change in how we do our economy. I really don't think we can have a you know, prosperous economy and a, a safeguarded environment. We, we need to make that adjustment of having the externalities priced and changed in the, in the way the economy runs. So greenhouse gas emissions are the clear big example, the one everybody's focused on. And our goal is to have those fully priced in the Canadian economy and all the revenue used to reduce other taxes. And that's really the combination. If there, if, in our view, if, the, if you are going to put a strong enough price on greenhouse gases that will cause the global warming risk to be reduced, it's going to be a lot of money raised. And if that isn't used to reduce other taxes, you're just going to kind of kill the economy. You're going to have a huge government. Um, and, uh, and, and you're going to have political 
political discord over that, uh, that adjustment. So we started this um, new not-for-profit and we thought, okay, we're gonna go after and try to educate voters um, that this is a good idea, that they should be demanding this of their politicians. Hey, you know, bring in revenue neutral carbon pricing. Um, and we did that for about a year and realized that that's a pretty tough slog. Um, this topic is way up there. It's not a top concern for voters. So we um, shifted and pivoted about uh, six months ago to focusing on political thought leaders. Uh, and actually most voters follow political thought leaders. So if, if political thought leaders across the you know, left, right, and center of our political spectrum were all promoting the idea of uh, revenue neutral carbon pricing, then voters would basically, uh, we think, go along with it. Um, and when you look at our political spectrum, you realize that it's actually uh, our leaders on the left, the orange leaders are pretty much there and the red leaders are kind of there. Um, but the blue leaders have been a problem um, in, across Canada, um, except in BC. It's actually the blue leaders in BC that brought in the BC carbon tax, which is the best model we think in the world. It's a fantastic model. Um, but at the federal level and across the rest of the country, um, conservatives have not been uh, at the forefront of this issue. So we, after our pivot, we've focused now more on the center and conservative side of the political spectrum. Um, and it's, it's actually um, for a number of reasons. Conservatives actually have the most to gain by supporting revenue neutral carbon taxes. They, they really have the it's really, they're, they're viewed and their self-perception is being the leaders of the economy, the, the strong, st strong um, economists and the, um, and the ones that are always fighting for lower taxes. And so, you know, there's, a, there's um, and, and some conservative leaders like Preston Manning are already strongly in this camp fighting for it all the time. So uh, our, our NGO today now focuses on on those leaders across, across the country, in particular in Ontario and uh, Alberta and BC. Um, I won't talk more about Canadians for Clean Prosperity unless uh, people want to during the questions, but um, it is where I spend most of my time. And finally, uh, I run an investment company called Up Capital, which invests in early stage, uh, renewable, uh, early stage clean tech uh, companies and partners a lot with uh, Murray and Tom Rand and uh, the Yarkturn Fund. And as you probably know, they've got some great uh, companies in their portfolio like Hydrostore and Morgan Solar.